Okay, so once again, I, I, I just like to quickly go through some of the key images of what we've been studying so far, starting as every morning with this, this perspective image. I'm not gonna go into elaborate explanations of these. So we moved from an introduction to perspective to um, this is one of the studies I asked you to do with perspective to applying perspective to simple forms, simple observed forms to more complex forms where we understand more complex, complex forms in terms of the simple underlying, in, in terms of a simple underlying series of geometric forms. Uh, we studied light and the elements of light and shadow, um, both on a, on a platonic or a simple geometric form, and as those principles apply to more complex forms. We did our own drawing of um, light and shadow on simple forms. Uh, we moved into uh, the beginning of planar structure which we are going to revisit today in relationship to a self-portrait. So we're gonna look at this image again in a minute. Uh, we studied planar structure in relationship to simple objects. We did our drawing in related to that uh, way of thinking. We studied light and shadow on a somewhat more complex form of a drapery. So th this is the drawing that you should be engaged in uh, you know, now, maybe some of you are finished with this. Uh, this will be due on Monday. It was it, technically the classwork for the remainder of Tuesday's class and then Wednesday. Uh, I wanted to, so that's where we are. We've gotten up to that light and shadow um, on a con complex form. Bringing into that drawing, we did our understanding of perspective um, the way to draw simple forms, how we can use our understanding of simple forms and apply them to more complex forms and bring that into a uh, more or less fully developed rendering of light and shadow on a somewhat more complex form. So I want to um, touch on something I spoke to Sefi about yesterday. Um, in a conversation, in a private conversation we had. Because I think maybe this is a question that comes up for several people or more than one person. So, Sefi asked me about the technique for turning the form, right? So, on this drawing by Proudhon, we have the light coming from above, right? So, this is a, a figure illuminated from above. And if we look at the light and shadow on, all, all of the parts of the body that are visible in this half figure, we can see the elements of light and shadow operating, right? Most clearly in terms of how we've studied it, the light and shadow on the figure's breasts. So if we look at the light and shadow falling on this form, we have the light mass and the shadow mass. So the question I think, or, or a difficult question for people often is how to turn that form. So you'll notice in this drawing by Proudhon, and we've talked about this, but I think it's worth going over. Proudhon is turning that form. So here's the terminator, right? But Proudhon takes that terminator, which he, which he would have started the drawing by, by stating that in a very stark, simple way. And then he, you know, sort of tickles in or um, nudges in this half tone, right? He's giving a little gentle tone that's transitioning. You know, it's a kind of gradient that softens the, the, the line between the, the shadow mass and the dark mass. So this tone here would have been a, a gently, um, you know, sort of like a gently touched in tone with the charcoal the artist is using. So, um, you know, that's one technique, that gentle tone, probably little strokes, little strokes that are doing something like this, 
movement that my cursor is doing with the drawing tool to make that smoky um, gradation that turns the shadow into the light. So there are other things we can look at in this drawing. Proudhon is using a technique where when we see the drawing from a distance, it has the appearance of a fully um, developed form. But we look up closer and, and Proudhon is using these strokes that roll around the volume, right? To reinforce the sense of the volume. He started the drawing, um, you know, with a ver some version of the technique we used to do our drapery, where we blocked in masses of charcoal and then blended that with a stump. And then he goes back in with the drawing tool. So this is a kind of carefully rendered um, way of doing that tone, okay? So actually, I'm going to add one image to the slideshow that I forgot to put in. Okay, so this is um, a cast drawing, a contemporary drawing by an artist who attends a very classical school. Um, a very classical school that's in New York. It's called the Grand Central Atelier. So um, they also similar to um, the Proudhon drawing, although this is more polished, obviously, you, you can see the, all those elements of light and shadow that we've been studying, right? So this large complicated shadow mass, core of the shadow, reflected light, and then notice that little, um, that little um, half tone that just transitions the shadow edge into the light, right? There's just that little tickled, um, half tone, where they're just sort of polishing that edge. So they're just giving a kind of gradation. You know, that little half tone there that just softens the shadow and transitions the shadow into the light. So it feels like it rolls around a form instead of being an abrupt division or an abrupt line. So in this drawing, sometimes the, the, the planar shift so the shift from the shadow plane to the light plane is sharper. So we get a more abrupt half tone. And sometimes it's softer. It's more of a roll around, a round form. So, and, and we get a softer, smokier half tone. So um, the Proudhon and then this Grand Central Atelier um, use of light and shadow and half tones is a kind of softer um, approach to it. This is a drawing by Pontormo, uh, who was a, a, an Italian Renaissance painter. So this is a very old drawing done somewhere around 15, 20, I don't know the exact date. So he, this artist is also using the same elements of light and shadow that we used. So this artist is not using quite the same, you know, laborious rendering of light and shadow, right? This artist, is using little marks, um, little strokes of the drawing tool to create the half tone, right? And, and those strokes wrap around the volume. So it gives us, and that actually gives us an increased sense of the volume of the arm, right? So they're using, they have their light mass, shadow mass, core of the shadow, reflected light, occlusion shadow, uh, and then they have the half tone, the half tones that are created by those little strokes that act as that kind of transitional tone. You know, there's many great things to look at in this drawing. Notice how the artist has conceived of the lower arm as a, a cone-like form, right? So we could conceive of this volume as a kind of cone, similar to the cone we drew 
with the light mass, shadow mass, core of the shadow, reflected light. So we have both a sense of an organic volume, but a very clear three-dimensional volume moving through space. Um, and then the artist has conceived of the upper arm as a different kind of geometric form. The artist has conceived of the upper arm as a kind of rectangular prism. And, and, and this is conceived of as a different geometric form because the muscles and the bones of the upper arm, the, the particular structure of the biceps muscle, um, the way we see um, at the lower perimeter of the upper arm, the inside of the triceps muscle, it creates more of a rectangular prism-like form. Um, and so the artist has very clearly conceived of a kind of box here as the initial conceptualization of that volume. And we're gonna be going back to that in, in our first self-portrait we draw today. Um, I, let me just say something. Um, this of course, you know, there's a lot to be admired in the labor and the skill that goes into this drawing. I just wanted to say that this is a much better drawing in most ways. This is a much, this artist much more successfully conveys a, a clear sense of volume and space. The way we have an absolutely clear sense of how these volumes move through the space, right? There's absolutely no mistaking the, the direction and the distance of that plane compared to that plane. Whereas in a drawing like this, where the artist gets bogged down a little bit in very fussy rendering, we lose a sense of the clarity of space, right? We don't, I don't have a really clear sense of the space, the spatial relationship between this part of the ear and that back surface of the, um, the back surface of the head or, or what's left of the back surface of the head in this fragment. So um, in terms of creating a very clear sense of three-dimensional volume and the way three-dimensional volume exists in space, this is a much better drawing. So I, I think it's worth pointing out that we don't necessarily want to get um, seduced by a certain kind of technical, kind of elaborate technical labor. It's, that doesn't always lead to better work. People probably have an in, in, in intuitive sense of that, but I just think it's worth pointing out. Uh, Puntomer is also one of the very best drawers in the history of drawing, so it's a little unfair. So uh, we're going to go. We've we you know as I as I've mentioned, we've studied our geometric forms, perspective. Uh, somewhat more complex forms, organic forms. For the last section of the class, we're gonna, we're gonna be drawing self-portraits. So we're gonna be going into the complexity of the human figure. Um, but we're going to be starting that by, by bringing what you've been studying in the sketchbooks into the work we do, let's say in class or you know, in, in our remote version of class. So we want to be thinking of these lessons we've learned in our sketchbook studies. So how do we conceive of the complex volumes of the human body as both planar structure? So this planar construction we see Bridgman using and the larger space that can be conceptualized in terms of this geometric structure that's conceived of as existing around that head. So we're going to be bringing those lessons into our, we're going to be doing a planar self-portrait today. So again, I want to emphasize that planar structure as a step toward understanding complex volumes is very common throughout history. So we looked at this Luca Cambiasso drawing. I mentioned how Cambiasso always made these geometric structural perspectival simplifications of the human figure uh, so that at, at the beginning of um, the process of making a painting so that he could clearly understand how the co complex organic figures that he would ultimately end up making exist in space. So here's a drawing that we might think of as transitional between this conceptualization and his more 
um, elaborate organic figures in his paintings. But notice in this simplification of the head, the artist is dealing with big planes, right? A big plane on the forehead facing the light mass, the top plane of the head also facing the light mass, and then the side plane of the head uh, in shadow and moving backward in space. So we have a clear sense of the three-dimensional volume and three-dimensional structure. We've looked at this drawing several times by Durer. We're gonna be doing a, something like this, but a, a little bit more um, organic than this. Planar structure is not merely a, um, a technique of the past. So a very famous contemporary artist named Kerry James Marshall is highly conscious of planar structure and you particularly see that in his drawings. So notice the way Kerry James Marshall in this drawing of a young girl is constructing the head in a way, in, in some many ways similar to the simple structure in this cambiasso, front plane, forehead, top plane of the head, side plane, moving in shadow, front plane of the forehead indicated by these two highlights, top very clearly indicated top plane of the head shown to us by the precise drawing of the part in the hair moving backward along that plane. Um, notice the side plane of the head that starts at the highlight on the forehead and it moves back this way. Kerry James Marshall is thinking about the planar structure of a bone called the zygomatic bone. This is a zygomatic arch. And then, and then um, the front point of the zygomatic arch transitioning into the front plane of the head. And so if we step forward quickly to the, uh, a planar conceptualization of the head here. Notice how Kerry James Marshall is in his drawing, he's conscious of, so just look at the front plane of the forehead, <clears throat> top plane of the head, side plane of the head indicated by the, the transition in the anatomy of this bone here called the zygomatic arch, which creates this side plane that starts right here. That is Kerry James Marshall consciously um, thinking about front plane, side plane, zygomatic arch, understanding those underlying structures of anatomy. Notice the way he's drawn the neck, clearly conceptualizing it as a full cylindrical volume. So Kerry James Marshall hasn't just casually drawn the cloth of the turtleneck, he's conceived of it as a cylindrical volume wrapping around the volume of the neck. So in spite of the kind of stylistic interpretation of the human body that's characteristic of Kerry James Marshall's work, um, we have a clear sense of this body existing in a, it, we have a clear sense of the, the believable volumes of the human body clearly existing in space. And by doing that, Kerry James Marshall is able to make works of art that function both symbolically, conceptually, but also believably as human beings. Uh, again, this is a Kerry James Marshall drawing where we see him clearly conceiving of the body as a planar structure. So that's clearly understood in the way the planar structure of the torso comes through in the sweater. Look at the planar construction that he's starting the arm with here. And then if we go close up on the hand, um, that's not a very good image because I had to go close up on a reproduction. But I still think you can see the way he's boxing out, constructing the planes of the fingers understanding the way those, that planar structure of the fingers relate to the implied planar structure of the hand. So that's, it's a technique that's still not used by all artists, the way you could virtually say it was at one time, but it's certainly used by contemporary artists still. And in the case of Kerry James Marshall, 
being used by a contemporary artist who you could easily make the case is making amongst the most important painting being made today. So um, just another example of a planar conceptualization. I believe we've looked at this before. So this is a, a, a anatomy teacher named Elliot Goldfinger. And I, I, you've seen these, I think, in the sketchbooks where he constructed this planar, um, planar conceptualization of the head. He's showing how it relates to an image of a model posing. And then also showing how it relates to the underlying anatomy. So if we look at certain anatomical features here, um, this, this bone here is called the frontal bone. And then we get, we come to the, this, uh, on the skull, we come to this arch, which is called the parietal arch. And that the parietal arch is the point on the skeleton or on the skull that marks the transition from the front of the skull, the front plane to the side plane. Um, so he's, he's simplifying that transition from front plane to side plane. So we get this kind of box-like mass of the head. Um, he's noticing how the zygomatic bone comes down and creates the mass of the cheekbone. And along the front corner of the zygomatic bone, we have the transition from front plane to side plane, front plane, side plane. Notice the ear sits very clearly on the side plane. If we um, look at the transition from the zygomatic bone to um, the, mac the, the dental the bones of the dental arch, this is called the maxilla. Um, we can see, the again, the transition from front plane to side plane, which is reinforced by a muscle called the rhizorus muscle. So you'll notice this little strap of a muscle here that runs from the zygomatic arch and inserts into the round muscles around the mouth called the orbicularis oris. And this, this muscle is a, a, an important muscle for smiling. So when we smile, this muscle contracts and pulls up the corner of our mouth. Um, so that, that bone, that muscle in conjunction with the bones creates this very commonly observed transition from front plane to side plane. So I'm not pointing these out because in this class, I expect you to memorize any of this anatomy. I just want to point out for anybody who may be interested that all, all of these elements of the structure of the body and how they help us understand how to make a convincing drawing of, of the human body is ultimately related to anatomy. And, and the study of anatomy in relationship to structure is certainly a useful um, thing to study if you're very interested in advancing um, with your drawings or paintings or sculptures of the human figure. Um, but that's something that would have to be pursued on your own or in other specifically designed courses. So um, just very briefly, this is um, a, a Hilma af Klimt drawing. So Hilma af Klimt was actually a pioneering and very famous abstract painter. Uh, there was a big show of her work, I think two years ago in New York. I don't know if anybody saw it. But like many, art, like many of the early abstract artists, they were originally um, representational artists. That was their training. So again, just looking at you know, a really beautifully rendered drawing, um, this artist is using white and black chalk plus red chalk. So it's a little bit like the, the uh, materials we used to do our drapery drawing, just adding red chalk to it. Um, so let's look at the structure. So if we really analyze the structure, we can see front plane from highlight to shadow edge. You know, a front plane where we feel like we could put the palm of our hand there and we would feel a flat surface. Then at highlight, there's a change in direction of the head change of direction of the head at the transition from front plane of the forehead to the side plane, change in direction of the head from front plane to side plane at the shadow edge. Here we have 
the reflected light that she's brought in with um, uh, with some white chalk added to the initial shadow tone, creating this side plane that's actually a side plane that will you will all be able to. We all share the same planar structure. Exactly how that's constructed from one person to another is a little bit different, but we all have this same planar structure because we all have similar skulls and we all have the same muscles. They're a little bit, they're constructed a little bit differently from person to person, but by and large, they're very, very similar. So we all share, if you light your own head the same way Hilma Hef Hef Klimt lit this model's head, you'll see these same planes. And that's what I want to be looking for in the self-portrait today. Um, Notice this slightly lighter, almost triangular side plane here. That's created because we all have a side plane that's created by this muscle here called the masseter muscle. And that masseter muscle originates along the um, bottom edge of the zygomatic arch and inserts into the corner of the mandible corner of the jawbone. And if you, if you clench your teeth very tightly, you can feel that muscle contract at the corner of your jawbone. That's the muscle we use to chew. So, and that muscle, the way it's, it's placed in relation to the zygomatic arch and the corner of the mandible or the corner of the jawbone, it creates this distinctive side plane. And we have a transitional plane created by, again, that rhizorus muscle before we get to the front plane. Notice here the highlight showing us the way the zygomatic arch creates the cheekbone and then transitions up along the front plane. So we have this transitional front plane following the structure of the skull. So uh, we're going to, we're, we're obviously not going to be able to identify the anatomy. Again, if, if anybody's interested in further studying the human body, you know, I, I often get students who have, who would like someday to work in comics or in, in CGI. Uh, if you're interested in the figure for those purposes, definitely studying anatomy will be very useful to you. Um, but again, that's something you would have to pursue either on your own or in dedicated classes to that. So, okay, we are going to be doing a structural planar self-portrait. Let me uh, just notice one thing. See the, see the simplification of the planar structure, um, the way the artist or the way Elliot Goldfinger has identified a a square-ish plane at the front of the at the front of the jaw, and you see Hilma Af Clint identifying that squarish plane that transitions into the, the backward moving plane of the of the jawbone. So we're going to be looking for that information today. Any question about any of these images? Okay, so I have set up, um, I have set up here my mirror. So you're, so you're all going to need to get a mirror. I'm sure everybody has a mirror of some sort um, that you can use. You could use something like this. Um, that's fine. You know that will certainly work. I can hold. I can place this here, and I can see myself in the mirror. Um, be better to get a slightly larger one. You, know, you can get a mirror, something like 12 by 16 inches at a dollar store at a Home Depot. You know, it's just a matter of a few dollars. Um, you can get larger ones. I think larger ones are five or $8. 
So if you don't have a mirror, you are going to need to get one for this drawing. Um, and, and you want to be creative. And I know everybody can do it. I've seen students do this forever. So that you somehow set up a mirror so that you're looking into the mirror like this. Okay. So you got to figure that out. Again, I, I've seen students do it forever. I know everybody can do it. Um, but it might take a little bit of ingenuity this weekend, or maybe you have some kind of setup where you can do that immediately. So I just want to confirm, I believe I have this setup, but you can see my three quarter reflection on the screen. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is, um, and I, I'm just going to, I'm just seeing what you see. So I was very, I haven't done a self portrait in years. So I feel like this will be fun. I hope you all find it fun. So I want to make clear about something. This can not, and I want to emphasize that, can not can not be done from a photograph. And I can always tell because we're not learning to draw from photographs. That's a whole different thing. We're learning to draw from life. So do not take a self portrait and then draw from the photograph. This is to be done from a mirror so that you're really challenging yourself with drawing from life. Um, and again, I've been doing this for 25 years. I know what drawings look like from uh, photos and I know what drawings look like from life. Uh, so I can always tell. Um, okay, so now what we're gonna be looking for, so I'm looking at, at you know, at phase. Okay, let me say one thing. I, obviously you're not gonna be able to set yourself up in a box, right? But again, part of the ingenuity that I'm asking everybody, asking for from everybody, is to set up a mirror and create a lighting situation where you have light mass, dark mass. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm lucky I have these north light windows, so I get this consistent light all day. Um, so, uh, you need to set up some situation like this. That you can do it with an, an electric light. Um, you can set up your the lights you've been using somehow. Um, or if you have a window and you want to determine if it's facing north, you don't want a window that gets direct sunlight because then you're going to get changing light. But if you have a window in your house that's facing north and you can use that, that's a, a great thing to do. Um, so somehow you need to set up a light, light side and a dark side. So we've been, because we've been using controlled electric lights, we have a, a very clear light and dark mass. So it's maybe not as clear looking here, but there's the, there's the light mass. And then we have this complicated shadow edge, right? Coming down right there. And we're going to be taking note of that. And then we're going to be taking note of, or trying to, trying our best to figure out what, what is the planar structure we're looking at. So if you look at the light on my face, so we studied light and shadow. Um, so look at the light on my face. So there's a highlight here, right? And then there's a half tone here. That's at the corner. This is the, we, we talk about that bone, the zygomatic arch. Here's the, the front corner of that zygomatic arch. Oops. And here we have a half tone. That's a little transitional plane, right? Between the side plane of my head and the front plane of my head, right? So the front plane like this. And so we have side plane, a transitional plane, a little side plane, front plane, 
that we have this front plane of the head and, and notice the half tone at the front of my chin. It's creating that little box like plane that we saw in the anatomical simplification and we saw it in the Hilma off Klimt drawing. So there's that half tone indicating the front plane. Then we have the light on the chin that shows us the transitional side plane. Then we have another transitional plane here at the half tone. And then where my head goes into light, uh, it, into full light, we have the side plane here. Now, if you notice right here, I'm gonna clench that masseter muscle. So we see that muscle activating. So when I clench that muscle, that muscle is tightening up and pulling my jaw tight against uh, the maxilla, it's put, pulling the mandible up to the maxilla. So again, and that muscle there in relationship to the zygomatic bone is creating this side plane here. And we have that front plane, transitional plane, side plane. Notice this highlight right here. That's that highlight we saw on the skull that I call the parietal arch. So that's that kind of cur backward curving plane or backward curving division between the front and the side of the head. So we're going to be trying to, to draw ourselves so that we take into account all of those elements. Okay, so I'm going to start and I'm going to start on my blue paper and I'm, I'm going to be drawing exactly as I've been starting all the drawings so far. So I'm going to raise that a little bit, bring my head backward a little bit. So um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm just simplifying the large, the large angles of the head and hair. I'm not paying attention to any small details. So that line there is the line from, did the camera just move? Or do you still have the same view? Okay, that line, this line I've drawn here is the line from here from this point on my head to this corner here on the jawbone. So I'm starting by blocking in just the very big masses. So just roughing in that shape. Okay, so, um, so this point here, to this point here, to this point here, is, um, is from, the, from the jaw, from the chin to jaw to the top of my, to the top of my head where it disappears behind my head. So I'm doing very simple. Blocking things in, in a very simple way. So I'm here going to think about the cylindrical like volume of my neck.
Okay, so now the now I have I have the perimeter of the of my head roughed in. Now I'm going to take two measurements. I'm going to measure the width of my head as I observe it in the mirror. And then I'm going to compare that to the height. So I'm going to measure the width. I'm measuring the width from the edge of my neck to the edge of my jawbone around that level. I'm going to ask myself how many times that fits into the height of my head. So just, just, it's just a little bit more than half of my head. So I've made, I think I've made this much too big. I've made this, I think about that too, that much too big. So once I have the first block in, I could see that I had made my head too big. I made my head too wide. refining a little bit that contour. Now just indicating the hair mass. So I'm going to start looking for some of the information inside the form. So I'm looking now at this little half tone Again, I'm going to treat that as plain. Start indicating some of the planes. Now, at, at this point, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Okay, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna indicate my shoulder, the height of my shoulder in relationship to the bottom of my chin. Start indicating the collar. Okay, so now that I have this fairly broad 
lock in. I'm going to place the center line. So I'm going to look at where, so the center line. So the line that divides up my face in half, that runs down, runs from the center of the chin, up through the division between the lips, up through this the philtrum here, up along the center of the nose, through that crease between my eyes, right, and right up the center of the head. I'm going to place that, and I'm going to look at the way it curves around that front plane of my face. Right, because my front, the front plane of my face isn't an absolutely straight line. It's instead it has a curve to it. So I have my center line. Now I'm going to rough in the placement of the features, not the features themselves, but just the placement. So where are my eyes located? So the, 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 my eyes, I'm gonna use as the indication of the eyes, the center line created by the tear duct here. So where is that on my head? It's going to be a right around halfway up the head. And I'll just measure that to make sure. So exactly halfway between these two points. a little bit higher. And that's virtually, virtually always true that your eyes are going to be halfway between the top of your head and your chin. So, um, now here is here I want to introduce uh, perspective and how it can relate to the features of the head. So we, we've been thinking about perspective pretty much in terms of simple, simple geometric volumes. But how does perspective relate to the head? So if we think about the construction of the head um, and we think about the placement of the features, the features are at least in theory parallel to one another, right? So if if I if I made a line from corner of mouth to corner of mouth, that line would be parallel with the center line of the head, with the line indicating the under the underside of the nose. So I'm going to be thinking of perspective, and because those lines are parallel to one another, they're, we're going to be seeing them in perspective. So I'm going to be placing the, the line that indicates my eyes. And I'm going to be thinking that of that as a straight line that has a perspectival relationship to the bottom of my chin, the line of my mouth. It's about right there. So these, these lines need to be in perspective with one another. So where, where between the line of my eyes and the bottom of my chin does my nose fall? 
so that my eyes, the bottom of my chin, are halfway between those two points. So if I go halfway between those two points, the nose is just a little bit higher than that. So just looking at the placement of those elements, I'm not, I'm not drawing those features, just looking at the placement. So I can start now to add a little bit more variation to the contour, keeping my drawing still very planar and very structural. So I'm refining the contour on the right-hand side of the head. So this is my brow ridge. So the brow ridge, right? This is uh, called the superciliary arch, technically. Um, but we all, we, using more everyday language, we refer to this prominence as the brow ridge. So in terms of the relationship to the line indicating the, the, the relationship between the tear ducts, the brow ridge is around here. So I mentioned this half tone here, with that little plane at the, the point where the zygomatic arch meets the muscles of the face. Um, so that's creating, that, that's a kind of important planar division. And this point, this high point on, on my left, as I'm looking up, it's the right side of my Head, but my left is looking at the self portrait. This point relates to this high point on the other side of the face. So I'm going to be looking at how those relate to, each, to one another. Again, it, in this perspective scheme. Small adjustments where I see the neck a little bit thinner. in my sad little jowl. The 
course, don't hesitate to ask any questions as I'm doing this. So I'm moving things as I as I see, as I make more and more relationships, I, I see placement of certain elements need to change. So I need to make my collar a little bit lower. So as I'm, I'm making adjustments, I'm, I'm staying with that structural kind of straight line approach. I'm keeping adjusting the better placements of different elements. I'm looking here, I'm noticing here how, again, I go from this half tone, that front corner of the zygomatic arch or the cheekbone. And it just, I'm putting in that little, kind of squarish half tone there. And I, I'm putting that in because it's an important the planar division. And then I'm noticing the way the side plane drops back in space. That plane is a side plane here to the front plane. So I'm indicating the line, that backward movement of the plane. Notice how, and this is not an accident. So we have a subtle highlight here, highlight and then everybody's hair follows the structure of the head, right? Hair has no st structure in itself, exactly. I mean, it does, each little strand has structure, but the, the small strands structure the big bond of the head. So notice how my hair, and everybody's hair in one way or another sort of do this, is wrapping around that, like the strokes of the individual marks. And they're creating, again, that division between the side plane here, plane that's moving like that and like that. There's a difference between that plane and the top plane. And I want to indicate that in the drawing. So I'm using, looking at where the hair wraps around the head. and starting to indicate, not just copying the shape, I'm certainly not copying strands of hair. I'm looking at the way the hair is, is helping me see the planes of the head. So in other words, the volume of the head. And then I'm gonna rough in the ear. And I'm going to draw that ear so that it is clearly sitting on the side plane of the head. And I'm going to look at, uh, so I'm looking here at my brow ridge, place my brow ridge. And I'm looking here at this top corner of my eyebrow. So there's a certain point on the brow ridge. I'm going to place that in an angle relationship with the half tone at the cheekbone. That angled relationship is something like that. 
And then I'm gonna look at the angle from the brow ridge to, my, to the top of my ear. So using these same point to point angle relationships that we used in our still lives. Oops. And I'm gonna place the bottom of my ear. And at the top of my ear. And I want to draw that ear so that it is absolutely sitting on the side plane of the head. My ears flare out a little bit, but still they're flaring out from their location on the side plane. So I'm going to draw the ear in such a way that that side plane is reinforced. So now I'm going to look at angle from this half tone or my mouth. Oh, I need to be a little bit lower. I'm going to put the plane of uh, this little triangular plane here. It's part of the muscle group around the mouth. Put that in. And then look at the relationship between the corner of my mouth and the bottom of my ear. So the ear is going to go around there. Lightly indicate the hairline. Again, always when I'm any of these elements of the head that I'm putting down, I'm, I'm thinking about where they sit on the big planes, big planes that I'm locating. So this line of, of my hair is sitting on the side plane of the head, and I want to draw it in such a way that that's clearly indicated. So just roughing in my hairline. So hair, you know, people often have difficulty with hair. Hair um, you always want to draw it so that it's clearly. So that it's clearly sitting on, uh, the, so that it's clearly reflecting the, the underlying structure. You don't want the hair to be some weird shape that doesn't seem to relate to the structure of the head. So I'm looking at the way, I'm looking at a few things, the way the individual marks of the hair wrap around those planes underneath. I'm looking at the way the, the combing of my hair because it sits on planes of my head re reflect that that structure. It's a little bit a little tough of hair back here coming out. So everything I draw, I'm drawing it so that it's wrapping around this volume I'm constructing. Not at this point, I'm not at all paying attention to any, not paying attention at all to any kind of detail. I'm not getting bogged down in the intricacies of the um, organic structures. Sorry. No idea 
Sylvia who's calling me from Bangs in New York. So this drawing today, we're going to be approaching just as a planar analysis. Professor, um, for people with like really long or big hair, is there gonna be a way you want us to like style it for? Just, just pull your hair. Yeah, if you have long hair, pull it back away from your head. Okay. Just like pull it back in a bun or something. Got it. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna now start analyzing and finding planes on my head. Okay? And you know, this is, this is obviously easier for me than it's gonna be for you guys, because I know, I have a pretty good um, understanding of the anatomy and I've been dealing with structure of the head for a long time. But so what you need to do is look really hard and ask yourself, can you, like find a planar structure um, in what you're looking at. So, so let's look. So I'm, I'm now, right now I'm starting with my, the corner of my eyebrow, right? Which is, that's the brow ridge, right? That's this prominent bony ridge here. And that's called, technically that's called the superciliary arch. Um, that's where my eyebrows are. And then if I follow that, that the hair of the eyebrow down, that's following along the bones of the zygomatic arch. And the zygomatic arch creates this protective cheekbone, right? It protects the soft tissue of the eye. So I'm going to do this in two ways. I'm going to be tracing out with um, my charcoal, and I'm also going to be indicating highlights that I see. So I have a highlight here. It's helping me see the side plane of the forehead. Okay, so that this highlight, so a highlight here, and then it picks up a highlight here again. So I'm connecting those two points. And then I have, I have this highlight here, right, at, at the cheekbone. And then if I look really, if I look at the light I have to stand in one place, it's a little bit, a little bit tough. So if I look at the light on my head, notice how here, this plane of my head is more strongly illuminated than this plane. People see that it's subtle, but it's there, right? This plane of the head is more parallel to the light source, so it's slightly lighter. And that shows me Plane I can identify this, this side plane of the head. And then, and then from the cheekbone, right, the, the cheekbone moving backwards along the side plane of the head. So that's the, that's the zygomatic arch. That's that bone on the skull we looked at. Then from that point down to the corner of my jaw, I can see another plane. I'm gonna indicate that with 
slightly lighter pass of the, of the of the white charcoal. So I'm starting by doing this, I'm starting to see in a convincing way the structure of the head. That lightness of that plane continues into my hair. So still using the white shot. So I'm starting to indicate all of the, I'm starting to indicate with the white chalk the, the all the planes on the side of my head facing the light source that are most prominently illuminated. And I, I'm putting the marks down in a way that's, that's following that started to indicate the texture of the hair as opposed to the texture of the side of the head. Now I'm going to I'm going to simplify my ear. Uh, professor, sorry to interrupt. The um, for people who have, uh, I guess, like more complicated hair texture, do you want us to mimic that too? Yeah, also. sure. If if you can like figure out a way to mimic it, yeah. I mean, avoid, what you want to do is you want to make sure that however you draw the hair, you're drawing it so that you're reinforcing the volume of the, he the head. So you okay. absolutely want to avoid doing hair like, like let's say you have straight hair. Absolutely avoid this, you know, making lines. If you have curly hair, avoid doing this. You, you right. Don't want you want to somehow... Would you... Texture. If you have like curly hair, um, cause that reflects light like super weird. You have a lot of like darks and lights and curly hair. Um, how would you suggest like simplifying that and mimicking the texture? Okay, so what I, before we end today, remind me and I'll, you know, I'll do like from my head the best job I can of indicating a way of doing that, okay? Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to, for now, I, I'm going to, I'm actually going to simplify this here more. 
than I thought I would um, for now. So, and this is just to, it, to emphasize something about understanding the structure and volume. I'm just going, I'm going to ignore all of those small details. I may go back in before the end of the day and put them in, but I'm just going to emphasize it here as you know, we can think of it here as being just a flat plane, right? If we abstract away from all of those little details, get rid of all of those little curly cues, um, we can think of the ear simply as a side plane. It's a side plane that's, illum that's generally illuminated. Now those little details, it's true, have lights and shadow masses, but I want to ignore, so let's ignore that for now. Again, I may go back into this. Okay, so continuing with the light, the lights on, my head. So Now I'm going to look at the lights, these planes of light, um, just as, again, just as, as a series of planes. So the first plane I'm actually going to indicate is the, the sort of large, important plane of the nose, the side plane of the nose. So uh, the, the side plane of the nose that I can transition down to the side plane, uh, the planes around the mouth that are illuminated.
So I'm just picking out these lights again as, as planes. So I'm really not drawing the features. I'm drawing the, the I'm drawing the planes around the features, and I'm just looking at the way the light and shadow is falling. So I'm looking at those lights. I'm looking at those darks, which I have not really drawn yet. I haven't blocked in any tone for the darks yet, and I'm just asking myself. How can I interpret those, those light masses, the dark masses, and the half tones as planes moving in a specific direction in space?
So again, just looking at those lights and thinking about them as planes. They're, they're, they're light because they're, they're a plane facing, either facing the light source directly or at a slight angle to the light source. So I'm just thinking about these initial planes of lights and shadows. So I'm, I'm seeing a slight under a, a slight shadow underneath my nose. Give us a slightly a slight tone there on that half tone. So I'm using, now I'm gonna be using the, the, um, the white charcoal a little bit more, um, maybe, maybe putting in a, a, a kind of light touch to indicate some of these half-tone things. And where the planes are more directly facing the light source, I'm going to put in a stronger area of light. Or I'm going to put in, put in I'm going to be, I'm building up the white charcoal for the planes that are more directly facing the light source. Just adjusting a little bit um, the size of the eye socket. I think that needs to get a little bit bigger.
No, there. I have a, a, a relatively light skin color. So if your skin is a darker color, um, you may want to indicate the light tones with a lighter application of the white chalk for the surface. And then you can indicate more in a more pronounced way the highlights, just depending on one's skin tone. Sometimes highlights are more common than in other people. So this application of tone is somewhat, although this is you know, far from an absolute accurate depiction of the tone, but it's somewhat reflective of my particular skin tone. So you may be um, varying the way you use the chalk or the charcoal. So now following, now following the way the light and shadow falls on my, on my neck and its relationship to So the, my neck is fairly strongly illuminated. So I'm putting down first just an overall light tone for that area. So I have a kind of middle light tone now for the neck and the part of my 
shoulders that are visible. And so now I'm going to go in with a slightly lighter tone just to indicate where things are lighter. So now down on the neck, if I look at this plane here, this plane, when I'm not talking, is a, a, a little triangular transitional halftone plane. So I'm going to indicate the lighter plane around that that turns that into transitional plane down there. Simplify these planes on the neck. We draw them, I'm taking out with the eraser.
So I'm just going to refine some of these points around the mouth. So by drawing, by concentrating on the lights, half tones, and shadows as planes, and if we're carefully looking at where those planes are in relationship to one another, we start to get at the features of the face without explicitly drawing the features. So I really haven't thought about drawing the mouth or the nose. I've just been thinking about instead the, the planes, the planes of the head in relationship to one. So the ear, and this is true of everybody's ear, the ear is generally parallel to the side plane of the head, the side plane of the ear. Now, of course, people's ears project out in different ways. But as, as people probably know, there's great variety. Some people's ears project out from the plane of the head significantly, and some people's ears are much flatter relationship to the plane of the head. Um, but it, the, the ear at least starts on the side of the head. So you want to indicate you want to make sure that you're indicating that, that there's a clarity of the ear originating on that side plane. Okay, so let's take our break and then we'll come up back and finish up. So let's break until 1144. Any questions before we break? Um, I was just curious, um, when would the self-portrait be due? Well, this planar self-portrait will be due, well, let's say, a soft due date of Monday. Um, if you need more time to work on it, that's fine. But I am gonna be, we are gonna be doing another self-portrait on Monday where we think along the same lines, but we try to render it more organically, but organically so that at the same time, 
it holds on to that planar structure. Okay. And so then um, for, cause next week we have Wednesdays, the last day, correct? That's right. Yeah. So, so this coming Monday, we have the, this planar self-portrait and the finished um, drapery. Yeah. And then um, sketchbook three would be due Wednesday. Yes. And then whatever um, the more in-depth planar portrait we do Wednesday as well. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will make that do whatever the last chance is before grades are due. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly when that is though. I don't know when I have to have grades submitted, probably by the weekend. Okay. So, you know, I'd certainly be happy to accept it up until the, the grading deadline. Okay. Right. Thank you. I mean, if this, I don't know, if this, it, people can let me know if this seems like a lot, you know, if with the drapery, this, the sketchbook, if that seems like a lot, um, you know, I can certainly make these due dates soft and we can adjust if necessary. That would be helpful, I think, if there was like a leeway a little bit on it. Okay. Um, well, you mean leeway like having beyond Monday or Wednesday to get it to submit it? Yeah, if that's possible. Yeah, I mean, we, everything that's, all these things we've just talked about, this study, um, the sketchbook, the drapery, those can all be due let me just look right now what it looks, let me see if I can pull up when. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you all can, since I'm sharing my screen, do you see like my desktop behind this um, shared screen or do you just see the view of my studio? Just the studio. Yeah, just the studio now. Okay, so you don't see like the icons below? No. Oh, okay. And so I, I just moved it on, on my own desktop. I moved that screen. Can you see my desktop folders back here? No. No. Oh, okay, all right. So. I'm just looking for. Just looking to see if I've received an email. I would think that you would have sent me a I'll, I don't see an email from the registrar letting me know exactly when grades are due. I think they're going to be due something like next Friday uh, or maybe before next Monday. So I'll let people know. But you, you can have up until um, next, you know, whenever the grades are due to finish these assignments. And those would be the only ones that yeah. were not, were the syllabus is completely like Toss yeah. it out. Okay. Ignore the syllabus at this point. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let's take our break. So let's um, come back at 1150 and um, we'll pick it up from there. Okay.
Professor? Professor, are you there? Yes. Um, this is Sefi. I'm still having a little bit of trouble um, on the drapery. Um, my um, shadow accents and Terminator are very dark and they look like straight lines, so it doesn't look three dimensional. Okay. Uh, so I tried softening the edge with little circles, but I guess I, if I do too much of that, you're not going to see the reflected light and the half tones. So I'm having trouble with the values, basically. Well, why don't you send me an image and I'll take a look. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, Professor. Hello. Yes. Uh, hi, sorry. Um, it's Sebastian. I was wondering, do you mind if I send in the sketchbook now? I, I didn't know it was due at 9 a.m. I just assumed it was Oh, there. yeah, that's fine. That's, yeah, OK. Don't worry about it. I just want to let you know. Thank you. Yeah, those deadlines are pretty flexible. OK. I mean, I think I have to put a, a, a time in, but yeah, don't worry about it. Oh, OK. Thank you very much. Oh, do, do you have a suggestion on how to actually like pin up the drapery by any chance? Like, how do you want us to like pin it up? Because mine, I feel like it's not showing enough shadow and light. Um, well, I mean, why don't you send me a photo of your setup? Okay. I'll be I'll be able to look after class and I'll get back to you. Okay, Sebastian. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sounds good. Excuse me, Professor. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I'm late on my sketchbook assignment that is due today because I forgot it's one of those few assignments where it's posted very early in advance rather than as we go by day to day. Um, how much of a penalty is it if I get in and late to you? It's okay. Don't worry about it. No, no. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Sorry about that.
Okay, so let's get started. Um, Sebastian, are you there? Uh, yeah, right here. Okay, so let me just, I don't, I don't know if this will help, but, um, and I don't know if other people might need this too, but so I'm gonna, so I hear, I have a drapery here. So I, I'm gonna start this by just pinning it Pinning it up like this. But I'm using a push pin. And then um, I'm just going to sort of roll these, these hanging things around. So I get something like that. And then, you know, those forms will will be plenty to create a shadow pattern. Now you're having trouble with that, um, Sebastian? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just thought it wasn't, uh, it wasn't giving me a good image. So I don't know how you wanted to do it. I mean, can you do this? Can you pin no, it? No, yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes more sense to like fold in the back. Yeah. I was just kind of hanging it and like it wasn't well, giving me. Fold it around the back. You have to manipulate it a little. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so. Okay, can you, you, you all can see my um, reflection in the mirror? Yes. Um, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna now block in the, the overall dark mass. So this whole side of my face is in shadow. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna trace out the shadow plane, the shadow plane in a in a somewhat, you know, again in a planar way. So there's the line of shadow kind of zigzagging, crawling along the planes of my head. And I'm gonna lay in the, the shadows lightly. something burning out my window. So I have a strong smell of burning. I don't know what that is. Kind of smells good, but maybe a little bit toxic. So I'm just going to block in the unified dark on the whole shadow pattern.
And just as always with the shadows, I'm gonna I'm going to be keeping the shadows broad and somewhat simplified. Professor, do you have any suggestions for how to um, do this in multiple settings if you have a, if your setup can't always stay or, because I have a two-year-old, so <laughs> things don't stay out. <laughs> you mean you have to like put the things away then set them up again? Yeah. Yeah, I would just, I mean, I have to do that kind of thing all the time. Um, I would, so just mark, you know, like maybe use tape to mark where your easel is on the floor or where your easel is on your whatever table you're using or use tape to just mark off where you have your mirror place. If you mark off the location of the different, uh, different things, um, you should be able to set it up again. Okay. Thank you. I mean, you know, actually, when I'm when I'm teaching in the studio at Queens College during the during regular academic sessions, uh -huh. um, I I have to set up. You know, we work on still lights for two or three weeks at a time, and I have to set them up and break them down every day. Yeah. Because other faculty use those rooms. Yeah. So I just using tape. I mark where the the table is on the floor. I mark where the different objects are on the floor and I just reset it up. Okay, so I'll do that. Yes, it does. Thank you. If you wanted to do this with the drawing knives, you could. Um, I, I want it to be a little bit more precise with the mark making, but you could do this with the drawing knives, blocking these big areas of tone. Should be wearing my glasses, so things are a little bit blurry. I feel like they're get. I feel like they're getting a little bit blurrier as I go on. So, any questions so far? What I'm doing or how I'm thinking about this? Are you using graphite right now or charcoal? I'm using the charcoal pencil. Okay. So now I'm going to go back with the white charcoal and again, just refining, continuing to refine some of these shapes. Now, something really important about the eyes. People love to draw those little almond shapes with the circle in the middle of them when you get to the eyes. And what people often neglect to see is the really, really important structure of the eye socket. 
So our eyes, which are, you know, most people would probably say the most our most valuable organ. Um, it's a very sensitive structure, right? It, it, it's sensitive. The, the membranes of the eye are incredibly sensitive um, and vulnerable. So we have this structure of the eye socket, which is designed to protect that valuable but delicate organ. And if you just draw that almond shape with the circle in it, but don't take into consideration the structure of the eye socket, then you're, you don't have a convincing representation of the eye or the human hand. So you want to look for the planes of the eye socket. That, it's that inset overhanging structure that's protecting the eye. So where So in, as I'm looking at my head, most of my eye right now is in shadow because the eye socket is setting is setting the eye, the, the eye is both underneath the overhang of the brow ridge. And it's set deeper than the prominence of, um, and it's set deeper than the prominence of the cheekbone, right? And those things, are set out from the eye in order to protect the eye. So you want to you want to draw the eye so that you're hyper conscious of the eye socket and not getting thrown off by drawing. Um, that almond shape without regard for the eye socket. So without that eye socket, without the structure of the eye socket, we go blind very quickly. So I'm going to start picking out some of the finer planes that are going to start describing some of the smaller features. 
So I'm looking at the plane here, the plane of the, the fold above the lip, right? That fold has a name, I forget what it is. But that's a plane, right? You see that as a dark because it is turned away from the light source as opposed to any plane that's a lunar. Therefore, facing the light source. Now, so I have my side plane of the head. I have the shadow plane. Now there's, I, there's a transitional. There's a transitional plane here. So it looks, it's doing something like this. So I have, you know, most of the major planes in the lights. So I'll go in and now start clarifying the difference between planes. So this most strongly illuminated, this plane here above the eye socket, that plane that's most strongly facing the light source. I'm gonna go in and clarify that.
So do people, um, as I'm putting in, in identifying these different claims and putting these in, do people see what I'm seeing? Yes. Okay. So do you feel like you'll be able to see those when you do the drawing yourself or seeing whatever version of those you have? Yes. The attempt will be there, but whether or not successful is a totally different story. So I'm now just starting to define some of the value relationships between these areas. So there's a little bit of a highlight here that just helps indicate that the difference between the top plane of the eye socket, the cheekbone delineating the side plane of the head, this little highlight that comes down along the front of that muscle I talked about, the mass center muscle. Again, just a little bit, it's just helping to delineate side plane of the head. Okay. Start to indicate the highlight on, I can indicate the highlight on the nose.
So I'd now go in and start to indicate some of the information in the shadow side. So the, the eye socket, the far eye socket is much darker. I, I would leave it at this for this portion of the exercise. Because people start seeing, they start getting a sense of just carving out some of the big major features or the big major structures just by looking at planes. You know, we can leave it at a state about like this. Um, you know, you certainly you could continue if you wanted to more finely articulate some of the smaller features, but you want to treat it as a, a completely a planar, a planar approach. Oh, so this is how you want ours to look like? Yeah. You can, the shadows, you don't really have to do detail like in the eyes and stuff? No, don't, yes, avoid, avoid the detail. Just look at the planes. Okay. Because I want people to see planes, not details at this point. And then we'll, we'll eventually figure out how to put the details into the planes. Does that make sense? And that would be for next week? Yeah, that, you, know, you should try to have this done by Monday. Okay. Because then we'll move on to a more organic self-portrait. Right. Okay. Anybody have any questions about any of this? Oh, um, you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go. You. No, it's you go first. Okay, I was just going to say, uh, do we start always from the head and then work our way into the neck? Like, what's your what's your best approach for this? You said outline the head first and then... I want to start with the neck. I don't, I mean, I, I don't... Like, how, how are you able to, like, proportion it so well? Because I feel like sometimes if I start, like, let's say I'm trying to draw a head or something like that, like, sometimes, like, everything fits too small and it looks irregular. You know, that's really, I mean, I don't have a, a silver bullet for that. That's really just practice and looking very carefully at those proportional relationships as we've been doing so far. Right. You know, measuring, but it, it's just a, really that's, again, just about practice. Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I, I'm sorry, I can't get. No, that's all right, that's all right. And then how do you want us to position the mirror again? You said like, it has to like expose. Well, you, know, you know, you want to have the mirror. So I'm looking straight at my drawing. Right. You have the mirror angled so that you you really don't have to move anything but your eyes. Right. Both your drawing and 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 the view of yourself that you're drawing. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. And I was just gonna ask, um, because you told me to mention it again at the end, if you could possibly just show an example of how you might simplify curly hair instead of kind of the straight hair. 
Uh, who's a I'm sorry, who's asking me? That's me, Grace. Grace, okay. So trying to think what's the best way to like I feel like I could do it um it just might end up looking like a beehive and that's what I want to like avoid so well let me let me think about that for a second what's the best way for me to well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can sort of do this out of my head. 